Mad Rush as customers scramble to register SIM cards. PNG China friendship sees 10 years. And youth touching lives through outreach programs. This is the National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Thursday's news. The Papua New Guinea Defence Force has sent its CASA aircraft to help in the search and rescue operations of eight people missing along Madang and Wewak coast. The eight are from the Waseragawi district in East Sepik province. They were reported a few days ago. PNGDF Chief of Staff Colonel Ray Numa has authorised the task for three days out of Madang. This has been confirmed by Commanding Officer of the Air Transport Wing, Lieutenant Colonel Eddie Miro. With just three days to the new year, the process of SIM card de deactivation on the 1st of January, mobile phone users were seen queuing up for registration today. Our crew visited several registration booths where mobile phone subscribers turned up in droves. Hundreds of mobile phone users were queuing up to register their SIM cards. They have three more days remaining to register before the 1st of January 2018. In Port Mosby, Digicel customers are registering their SIM cards outside Vision City, while B-Mobile customers have selected areas for SIM registration. Nick Roy and Michael Nick are two digital subscribers. Both live in Gerewo and have spent over three hours standing in line to register. The SIM card registration is compulsory and is part of the national government's aim to have all mobile phone users register their SIM. Since the NICTA Act was passed in August 2016, all telecommunication companies are required to register their subscribers. This means all SIM card holders in the country must register their SIM cards before the 31st of December this year. Over the last 18 months, mobile service providers have set up booths at selected parts in the towns and cities for SIM registration. However, NICTA say the implementation by mobile operators is very slow, especially for mobile users in rural PNG. The SIM registration process is a step forward in PNG's ICT sector as PNG transitions into the digital world. Thus, NICTA is working with banking and education institutions to help promote the registration of SIM cards. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Patron of the China PNG Friendship Association, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, was pleased with the bilateral relations between China and Papua New Guinea. In commemorating the 10th anniversary of the China PNG Friendship Association, Sir Michael says this friendship has grown since both countries established an understanding in 1976. The Chinese have been in the country for over a hundred years and have been providing services to most rural areas. Celebrating 10 years of friendship with PNG, the Chinese PNG Friendship Association since 2007 has members right across Papua New Guinea. 
Traditional dances from PNG in China were performed. <laughs> PNG performers who were part of the cultural exchange program developed by the association also showcased the popular dragon dance. <laughs> Vani Neds, the China PNG Friendship Association ambassador, said the association would continue to strengthen community projects. Living in PNG, coming together, dedicating their time and effort to help our people of Papua New Guinea. We are seeing how empowering the community can make a lot of difference. And if we all come together, show some love and support towards China PNG Friendship Association, we all can make this world a better place to live for everyone. The Chinese PNG Friendship Association also runs an orphanage center and had the performance by the orphans. Grand Chief Sir Michael Samara explained a brief history of how the new independent state of Papua New Guinea engaged in diplomatic relations with the Republic of China in 1976. We should have a friendship relationship. That's the purpose of us here tonight. We established relationship. Our first contact in 1976, immediately when we became independent in 1975, we recognized China. First diplomatic relations. When the world was fearful of China, Papua New Guinea opened its eyes and said, yes, we will be friends with China, we will make friends. Today, what has happened today? It's like a revolution. So I just want to say this, because I want young people to know that these things did happen. The Grand Chief hoped the PNG-China relationship would continue as part of the bilateral relation where there are mutual trust and understanding. It was very important establishment of relationship because with relationship you can do a lot of things. Traditional dances all the way from China showcased the traditional dance and Chinese opera singing. Chinese PNG Friendship Association has 5,000 active corporate members nationwide. Adelaide Sirx Kari National, MTV News. East New Britain province was one of the first contact points of the Chinese immigrants as early as 1898, building the foundation of what is enjoyed today. The China PNG Friendship Association arrived in Kokopo today to celebrate its 10th anniversary. The 67-member delega delegation was led by patron Grand Chief Sir Michael Sumari and included Kokopo MP and Tourism Minister Emil Tamur. They were welcomed at Tokwa by Gazelle MP and Police Minister Jelta Wong. The delegation, together with Mr. Tamur, visited various iconic tourist sites looking at opportunities to promote interest and trade. 27 youth from the Reformation Church centers of Papua New Guinea are making a difference with their outreach and empowerment programs. The youth from Port Mosby and Leigh visited remote places in the Waubulolo district with a message of giving hope to others. They also donated food items and gifts. 27 youth from Nine Mile Makana Morobay Block and Leigh City traveled home to Waria Valley for Christmas and were welcomed by over 100 people from Teresa village. With one heart, one mind, and one mission, their message was centered on change and oneness. Gwani Siria, the youth president, says it's about unconditional joy. And you can do and make a better living even though you're in a remote area and there is no, literally there are no roads and lights, but slowly there are things changing like we have solar lights and such things and 
part of the convention, we bring these things to the village. We bring lights and we bring food and we bring music and we bring all these things that we have here in, in cities and towns back home. And part of it is we want their lives to have a change, a real life change, an impact that, that is meaningful in their lives, to transform, especially in their mindset, to be a part of the outside world as well. Colonel Beno Masiria was the guest speaker of the youth convention and said such events motivates and educates youth to pursue their journey with the Lord, which nourishes them. Why, among many, uh, God has you know, decided that they will be the one to live in this type of time, in these generations. So we taught, 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 taught them to make a living, having God as a center of their life, and then having God as a center of the family that they will actually make, and how to start a life by establishing themselves in the Word, and then correspond their life also to the word, how God wanted and intended life to be like. Maggie Syria spoke on behalf of the youth with concerns raised on education and the need for inclusion. She said, most resolved to drug and alcohol. This youth convention was a bonus to the youth of the Waria Valley for motivation and empowerment for a positive change in their lives and society from that convention, they will um, help their community, their parents, tribe and clan, because in Warrior Valley there are a lot of um, villages and communities where um, infrastructure is yet to reach, but I'm sure that that convention, the highlight would be that um, the main message was obedience is better than sacrifice. Lillian Kinea, National MTV News. Eviction victim Lucy Argen entered her home late last night at 11 p.m. after obtaining a restraining order. Lucy says police responsible for the key to the gates failed to adhere to the order. However, she told MTV News her property taken by police are yet to be returned. She has urged police to be responsible and follow the rule of law. <laughs> All the something will make him all same. Now, middle I feel him bell, but middle I broke now back up. Now, all the something blow me blow cook him, cook him. That's all. He's up then or load him locker now. He got through my low one of my middle and so so. Now, middle I sit down or same stuff. Sand back cooking middle and that's back and come and have the middle and middle and wait or same stuff. In a blow police said he got through my low one of my blowing. All must got him come. All must got him come back and low. Yeah, now, now yet before the two tag. Police in Alatau are yet to confirm the capsizing of two outboard motor power boats with 10 people on board. A reliable source has told MTV News the two boats were transporting a casket to an island for a funeral service. Three survivors are seeking medical treatment at the Alatau General Hospital. Continuous strong winds and rough seas are also hampering the search by authorities. Police in Alatau have warned that travelling during bad weather conditions is indeed a risky business. Here with National MTV News, we'll have more after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. Five men were arrested by police in West Epic Province for illegal entry and smuggling of prohibited items at the PNG Indonesian border during the festive period. Among them were two juveniles who are now housed at the Indonesian consulate. 70 police personnel were also deployed to logging camps in Nuku, Aitape and Telefomin districts to address lawlessness, especially drunk and disorderly behaviour among the youth. During the maritime operation, 40 32-litre jerry cans were confiscated. Provincial Police Commander Chief Inspector Moses Ibsagi has commanded residents of the border province for a quiet Christmas celebration. Turning overseas now, Manus is among the top 10 most tweets about hashtags. This can be attributed to the closed detention center that housed some refugees. Twitter managing director Susie Nicolet says Twitter is the best social media platform to see what's happening and what people are talking about. The internet never fails to deliver. Trump gave everyone plenty of ammo from the day he was sworn in. It's not so important. You should have 
Oh, surprise! I have no. some pretzels for you. I'm important. Oh. You want to be me, don't you? Quite a figure, quite a figure. And no. Looks like we have a problem. Yeah, leave it to me. Okay, we're gonna squeeze him. Then there was the Kofifi tweet six months later and still no one really knows what he meant. But it was this relatable parenting moment um, that had the whole world lolling. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. And speaking of live TV mishaps. Hello and welcome. Now to sport with Meredith Sheenan. Move over, Natasha Exelby, because it was this British entertainment reporter who actually broke the internet this year. Are you a fan of the originals? Never seen it. <laughs> Bleak, dystopian, an absolute nightmare, to be honest with you. That's just my interviewing techniques. Billy <laughs> said, would you be interested? I said... How much? Edward, show me the money! <laughs> It wouldn't be an internet roundup if we didn't mention a Kardashian or two. Kendall Jenner causing uproar with that Pepsi ad. Turns out you can't stop a riot with a can of soft drink. Who knew? Thank goodness for Salt Bay. He set the standard for sexy seasoning. With moves like this, it's no wonder this kid went viral. It was a boy from Tennessee fed up with his tormentors that pulled at our heartstrings this year and caught the attention of the world's biggest stars. They call me ugly, they say I have no friends. What'd they do to you at lunch? Put milk on me and put ham down my clothes. Forget funny animal videos, we were very engaged and informed citizens in 2017. So Twitter is the best place to see what's happening and what people are talking about. And there was a lot of great conversation happening on the platform. Um, if we look at our top 10 hashtags, uh, politics was really what came up at the forefront. So our number one hashtag for the fourth year in a row was Ozpol. Ozpol is a hashtag where Australians can come together to talk about politics. Um, so again, that was our, our fourth year in a row of that being the top hashtag. And the second, uh, number two hashtag was marriage equality. So a lot of Australians came together to really sharing the experience around the marriage equality campaign. And two lifelong friends in Hawaii got a life-changing surprise this Christmas. It was an amazing discovery. Alan Robinson and Walter McFarlane have been the best of friends for 60 years. Well, we love to play cribbage. We've been playing cribbage all our lives. And uh, I beat him the last time we played. The two were born and raised in Hawaii and they played football at Punahou. When did you guys first meet? High school? No! Back in sixth grade. Sixth grade? Yeah. Oh, okay. When we went there. He was the partier. I never went to uh, did any partying in high school. They also shared a special bond throughout their friendship. Walter never knew his father and Alan was adopted. And I had a younger brother that I lost when he was 19. So I never had nieces or nephews and I thought I'll never know my birth mother, I'll never know who my, I'll never have any nieces or nephews. With the help of his family, Walter searched for answers for years through the internet and social media with no luck. So they turned to family DNA matching website. So then we started digging into all the matches he started getting. At the top of the list of DNA matches was the username Robbie737. The results showed Walter and Robbie737 had several matches in their DNA, including identical X chromosomes. Remember Alan? His last name is Robinson. And as a nickname, everybody called him Robbie. And he flew 737s for Aloha Airlines as a pilot. It turns out Alan had also used Ancestry.com to find answers about his family. After a few phone calls back and forth, the men learned they shared the same birth mother. It was a shock. Yeah, it was a shock. Yeah, definitely a shock. But then when he thought about it, compared forearms and everything. Hairy arms, that, that did it. <laughs> the two revealed the discovery to friends and family Saturday night. 
without further ado, my brother. It was an overwhelming experience, and it's, it's still overwhelming. I don't know how long it's going to take for me to get rid of this feeling. Now that the initial shock has set in, Walter and Alan say they have plans to travel and enjoy retirement together. This is the best Christmas present I could ever imagine having. It really is a Christmas miracle, and we're just like so happy that we found it. Employees in Australia could be forced to make more casual staff permanent under a union push to stop workers being exploited. The ACTI is launching a natural campaign for change, sparking a bitter battle with business groups. Too many casual staff are being denied permanent positions. That's according to the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Next year, the ACTU will fight for changes to the Fair Work Act to legislate a new definition for casual work. Employers could be banned from denying requests from casual workers to become permanent after six months, a proposal rejected by the Fair Work Commission in July. To make sure that Australians have good steady jobs, jobs they can count on, all workers get basic rights. Labor will consider the changes, arguing casuals do play a role in the workplace but shouldn't be the primary method of employment. We are going to look at the definition of casual in order to ensure it is used for what it was originally intended to be used for. But industry groups warn the proposal would harm businesses and lead to fewer jobs. The policy is completely unfriendly to small business. Un uh, employment will drop in small business if they bring this policy in. Employers deny the proportion of casuals in the workplace is rising, noting levels have remained stable at around 25% for the past two decades. Still in Australia, a major clean-up is underway after severe storms slashed parts of southern Brisbane. Heavy rain and destructive winds ripped roofs off houses. We're at Cumbia on the outskirts of Kingaroy, which copped the worst of yesterday's storms. More than 20 homes have been damaged with roofs ripped from homes and sheds. Residents say they haven't seen anything like this for decades. We had a good neighbour rang me up and warned me that my roof had disappeared, but one always hopes that perhaps it's not as bad as what it sounds, but when I got home this morning, of course, I was surprised. Oh, you see it on movies, but... You don't think it's going to happen in real life? Very strong winds, very strong. It was um, tipping the um, trees, trees over pretty good. Almost every street in this small town is littered with debris. Trees have been uprooted and authorities are working hard to try to clean up the mess. They say the storm left a path of destruction all the way from here to Kingaroy. Widespread. Um, I mean, it causes a, a fair, fair bit of community angst because they can't get from A to B fairly comfortably. Across the state, the SES has had more than 100 calls for help. Yesterday's supercell lashed parts of the region, bringing wind gusts of up to 111 kilometres an hour and large hail. Cars have been badly damaged. This one at Oki was only a week old when the family was caught driving in the middle of the wild weather. To England and Prince Harry taped an interview with former US President Barack Obama for BBC Radio broadcast yesterday. Obama talked about the power of the internet and told the prince it is a challenge to make the opportunities most provided by social media. All of us in leadership have to find ways in which we can recreate a common space on the internet. Mm -hmm. One of the, the dangers of the internet is, is that people can have entirely different realities. They can be just cocooned in yep. information that re reinforces their current biases. And Dreamworld's Flying Theatre is the first of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. It is hoped to increase visitor numbers. The simulation described as a flying theatre will be the first of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's the ride's ability to be enjoyed by people young and old that's at the core of its attraction to Dreamworld management. The 40-seat iRide will take visitors on a suspended journey of a hemispherical screen with special effects such as wind, sound and scents helping to immerse guests in the experience. We see this as a, as a first step and a first big step in terms of new attractions to reinvigorate uh, not only the park but I think 
tourism generally. It's wonderful to see Dreamworld leading the way with this brand new technology. The announcement kicks off a $25 million spending spree aimed at boosting visitor numbers following the deaths of four people on the Thunder River Rapids ride last year. We've also got some surprises left and uh, we'll be announcing a few things over the coming months. The park's CEO is tight-lipped on what other attractions are planned but many will be suitable for all ages. It's a move away from the park's focus on big thrill rides at least for the next few years. You'll see that the announcements we make in the future will probably also have that family appeal. All nine of the thrill rides were closed for safety audits following the tragedy. Eight have since reopened with checks of the wipeout due to be completed in the next few days. The iRide Flying Theatre is expected to open its doors in late 2018. And now a look at the finance news. The Kino closed unchanged at 0.3095 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your kino was buying 0.302 US dollars, 0.3846 Australian dollars, 0.2498 Euro and 33.83 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee, cocoa and copper close the day higher as well. Crude oil is trading higher, palm oil close the day lower while copper close the day higher. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 28 points higher, the ASX closed 18 points higher, and the All Ordinaries 19 points higher. Here with first day's news, we'll be back with more in a few minutes. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Severely ill Syrians have been evacuated from a rebel-held suburb to the capital for medical treatment following an agreement between the Syrian government and the rebel group. The deal also involves a prisoner swap. At this stage, it's been very slow progress as only a fraction of the people, mostly children, on a list of 29 have actually been allowed to leave uh, eastern Ghouta. This did not come about because of any sort of widespread international pressure, but rather because of a deal that was brokered between the regime and one of the leading rebel groups in the area. They drafted a list of 29 names. They did not have any control over whose names were on that. That was determined by medical teams on the ground, but they are deemed to be the most desperate of the desperate in exchange for allowing them to leave Eastern Ghouta and seek medical assistance. The rebels agreed to then release 29 individuals whom the regime had asked for. This is, however, but a fraction of the people who are actually in such desperate need within eastern Ghouta. There are around 640 people who need urgent medical assistance or else they do risk dying, not necessarily because of injuries that were brought on directly by the war or the violence, but because they have chronic illnesses, diabetes, heart disease. Children are still suffering severely of malnutrition. Food prices are astronomical. One can only hope that in the future, the regime and the other parties that are involved will perhaps find a shred of their humanity and lift the siege or at the very least allow those that need medical assistance to access it. Russia is urging the United States to reach out to North Korea and start a dialogue. This is because the standoff between both countries is hurting the tourism industry. Visiting North Korea is, for some travelers, irresistible. Seeing Pyongyang, interacting with North Koreans, getting into one of the most isolated countries in the world can be the trip of a lifetime. Nick Bonner's been taking tourists to North Korea for nearly 25 years. Since 2013, about 4,000 Western tourists have visited the country every year, but not anymore. There's a lot of fight and tension. There's a lot of inflammatory rhetoric from coming from the U.S. and North Korea. Yeah. Much more frequent missile and nuclear tests going on. How has that affected the tourism industry? Yeah, significantly. I mean, it's down at least 50 percent. But bizarrely, it's it also at the same time, you think it would be more, but a lot of people are still fascinated by what is going on in the country. Bonner's business took a hit when American tourist Otto Warmbier died after being detained in North Korea for 17 months. The U.S. government later banned Americans from traveling to the country. But Bonner says it's still safe to go in, as long as you follow the rules. Nothing's changed. It's been it's the same as it has been. It's You're with the two guides all the time. You're well looked after. Uh, it's safe, provided you 
stand by the rules. We give everyone an hour's briefing before they come to the country. We go with them around the country and providing you, you understand that this, you know, it's not a holiday, it's an experience. It's in that way, um, we, we, you can avoid any problems. But when it comes to tourism to North Korea, it's not just about safety. It's also about the money and where it goes. Western travelers often pay a lot for package tours. Prices are set by the North Koreans and foreign tour operators determine the markup. A seven-night stay can cost around $2,000. What do you say to critics who say, look, bringing tourists into North Korea funds the regime and could even fund the nuclear program. What do you say yeah. to those critics? We run a company of 12 people. We're taking half the tourists going in and we survive just you know we're, none of us are sort of wandering around in rolls royces and swanking it up it's 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 a tough business we're in it because we find it fascinating i believe very strongly in engagement i think no tourism not only opens your eyes it's uh certainly opens the north koreans eyes but as tensions between north korea and the international community continue to grow opportunities for engagement are only shrinking Peru's former president is asking his country to forgive him after serving his 25 years for human rights abuse. He says the controversial pardon took him by surprise. But critics say it was purely a shady political deal. Convicted of bribery, abuse of power, and authorizing the killings of civilians by death squad, the former Peruvian leader looks frail in a hospital bed, asking for forgiveness for his crimes. I am aware that what resulted during my administration on one hand was well received, but I recognize that on the other hand, I have also disappointed other compatriots. To them, I ask forgiveness from the bottom of my heart. From his hospital bed, Alberto Fujimori also thanked the current president, who unexpectedly issued a pardon on Christmas Eve in the midst of Fujimori's 25-year prison sentence. It was a move that led to outrage. Angry Peruvians packed the streets outside of Fujimori's hospital, some chanting traitor, and the pardon has to go. Protesters and authorities clashed in the country's capital, riot police throwing tear gas at the crowd. President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski says it was a humanitarian pardon, justified because Fujimori's health is failing. I am convinced that those of us who consider ourselves Democrats cannot allow Alberto Fujimori to die in prison. Justice is not vengeance. All pardons are by nature controversial. There is an important number of Peruvians who are opposed to the pardon. My decision is especially complex and difficult, but it is my decision. His decisiveness may have thrown salt on the wounds of an already grave political crisis. News of the pardon led several members of Kaczynski's own party to resign. And last week, he narrowly dodged impeachment over a corruption scandal. It was the abstention votes by 10 lawmakers, including none other than Fujimori's son, Kenji Fujimori, that allowed the president to stay in power. Angry cries from the streets of Lima not only protest the pardon, but the idea that a deal may have been done between the former and current leader. The reality is that this, sadly, was a political agreement between the Fujimorists and the current government of Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. So we're coming out to reject all that. Now there's a new twist to contend with. Fujimori's doctors say his condition has improved. The once brutally authoritarian leader has moved out of the intensive care unit and, depending on his progress, may soon be released as a free man. An event that could sow more discord in the streets of an already divided Peru. Back home, and Bondo Francis will be pursuing a substantive case which he filed on human rights grounds regarding the SIM card registration deadline on December the 31st. Francis filed an urgent application and has provided a solution for the entire mandatory process to be made flexible, optional, and voluntary. This is to allow subscribers to register their SIM cards at their own convenience. Boundo Francis is a lawyer who is interested in human rights and a concerned subscriber who has launched an urgent application with the Waigani National Court. He told MTV News there was initial failure by the state and NICTA to facilitate a broader consultation and awareness on the SIM card registration and regulation. Practical realities of life 
which have to be taken into consideration before implementation of the mandatory process. But at the moment as I'm speaking, that has never been done. But what the state has done is that it has come up with a blanket regulation, which is the SIM card registration regulation 2016. And most people are not even out of the existence of the regulation, or not even a, a specific or a particular provision of that particular reg regulation. And there was nothing like a consultation, public consultation. Nothing of that sort was done or conducted right throughout PNZ to make people aware that such will happen. And that is what the state and NICTA have failed on their part. And he is seeking the court support for the mandatory process to be relaxed. If there is a mandatory requirement that you have to register your SIM card, then you have to do it, irrespective of the failures, the initial failures by the state and NICTA. So what I'm seeking before the court now, basically, is for that mandatory process to be relaxed and made optional, or voluntary, or it has to be made flexible. Meaning that, in this case, there must not and ever be a deadline given. Because it has to be optional, voluntary, or flexible, so every registered or every SIM card holder in this country can register his or his SIM card at a time convenient with him or her. And that is what I see as the way forward, and that is fairer more justiciable, more proper, and more appropriate in such an exercise like that. He said citizens must not be deprived of their basic human rights, which is a preamble to the PNG constitution. Well, then we are being deprived of our rights under the constitution, as I mentioned, and people will start losing context, especially, you know, People living in Port Mosby lay, especially in urban centers and towns, because uh, restoration is occurring at certain locations within urban centers. They may think that they are fortunate, but the other side of the coin is that you've got contacts who are also living in remotest parts of the area. Or your contacts may be some busybodies who don't or who doesn't have time to resist that. Uh, and his number or her number has been deactivated or removed from the registry. So you may be feeling that you are lucky, but you, somebody is suffering and you also affected, meaning that you can no longer contact him or her through the phone. So what did you ask? And mm -hmm. especially those people who are conducting businesses online are also losing out on that opportunity or on that service. That's one disadvantage. So there will be a mass chaos in IT in PNZ. Bound also provided a solution to this process. My best solution is for NICTA and state to reconsider their position to make the entire process voluntary, optional, or flexible, meaning that there must not and ever be a deadline given to anyone. It has to be made optional, flexible, or voluntary where any SIM card holder in PNZ can register his or his SIM card at the time convenient with him or her. Fabian Hacklitz. National TV News. On a related note, a concerned citizen, Stanley Tony, claims the SIM card deactivation process enforced by NICTA is in violation to human rights. He says this does not take into consideration the rights of people like those living with disabilities. We are talking about able bodied people coming to the nearby centers, coming to the nearby centers to register their SIM, SIM card. However, 
looking at the old men and women, looking at the looking at the children who are below the age of 16, looking at the people who are disabled, not able to walk, not able to walk to the nearby stall to do their registration. How, how can we strategize? How can we go to this, uh, this very needy people to do their SIM registration? And I don't know what particular strategy will the, the people who are concerned in doing the SIM registration a compulsory to go to this very, very people You're watching National MTV News. True Guy Sports is up next. We'll have the details for you when we come back. Stay tuned. True Guy Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. The NCD Governor's Christmas Cup began the knockout stages today at the Coney Tigers Oval. 16 teams went head-to-head -to, -head to secure a spot in the final. The finals will be played on Sunday at the Coney Tigers Oval. Five women's teams will also be vying for a spot in the grand final this weekend. Five all teams have all been able to take part. Now, all been uh, first second by play. We now belong back on top by Lusa Bakam don't play him to uh, Lusa Bakam don't play him a winner blood third fourth then a two play winner it by playoff and then uh, we'll the qualify long cup playoff too. Teams from different suburbs in the nation's capital have been impressive during the tournament, earning a spot in the knockouts. Freeway Bumpers, Nine Mile Giants, Makana Cowboys. The more teams were the more come strong. Teams will be playing for the plate, bowl, and cup playoff on Sunday. The winners will walk away with prize money. All prizes, when we look at some cup winner by one them twenty thousand, and we more total men, and then runner up ten thousand, and then go down the bowl, up at bowl and plate. The knockouts and semi-final rounds will run for the next two days before the finals on Sunday. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The cricket and the PNG Garamuts have named the 2018 ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup team. The squad consists of 15 players and will be captained by Vagi Karaho from Pari Village. The Garamuts leave for New Zealand on the 5th of January and will kick off their World Cup campaign with two practice matches against the West Indies and New Zealand. And we'll have more of Trukai Sports on the other side of these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports to Football Now. And new inclusions in the National Soccer League 2018 season have sparked interest in the provincial franchise club's participation. The semi-professional competition could see the league standards raised with its regular season commencing on January the 6th next year. January looms with the regular season campaigners Medang, best FC and defending champions Lacey T. Dwellers, confirmed to run into action on January 6, 2018. So far, 12 teams have shown interest to participate next season, including Manos and Millen Bay. The Millen Bay franchise club, Eastern Stars, looks to make a re-entry into the competition, while newcomers FC Moro Bay Wawans are banking on the provincial government for support. Other teams include Manos, Oro, Erema Gulf, Unitec, Southern Strikers and the Simbu franchise. PNG Football Association President David Chung said the league organization which franchise clubs are expected to work in partnership with stakeholders and part owners of franchise clubs for sustainability. However, the NSL competition will play a pool system if it's eight teams and a round robin for six teams competition. All NSL franchise clubs are encouraged to take ownership of activities to maintain sustainability. All clubs must be incorporated as a company and be registered with IPA and there is to be no conflict of ownership. Clubs must also have their home ground or demonstrate their ability to have their own ground to host matches and generate revenue. The annual affiliation fee and player registration fee must be paid a month before the competition starts on the 6th of next month. Each franchise club is also asked to submit their master list maximum of 30 players, including team management. Lists of foreign players should be no more than five, with only three permitted to take the field at any one match. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. 
And that's a wrap for Trukai Sports. We go for a break now. When we come back, the weather details for Friday. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. A quick look at the weather now in the NGI region. For the next 24 hours, fine weather expected in Kaving and Buka, partly cloudy for Kimbe, a shower or two expected in Lorangao, Kokopo and Rabaul. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield with doing with Dulux. And that's a new sport and weather for today, Thursday, December the 28th, 2017. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>